Hi everyone, um, welcome to this short lecture which accompanies the channel talent session on the American election which is running on the 5th of November. My name is Emma Long, um, I'm going to be seeing you on uh, November the 5th, I'm going to be running that session so I look forward to, to seeing you then. Um, the purpose of this lecture really is to um, give you some background detail on the way in which American elections work um, and how they operate. So I know some of you might be currently studying American politics or you might be coming up to study American politics or you might just have a, a general interest in it. So the purpose of this session really is to perhaps fill in some blanks for you so that when we come to the session on November the 5th, um, you have um, some things to, to think about and maybe possibly some questions to, to ask as well. Um, I look forward to having our discussion then, um, but in the meantime, uh, we are going to take a very quick look through the US election system. So the first thing to remember when we are talking about uh, American elections is that we are talking about elections plural, not just a single election. So on election day in the US, which is always the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, voters might well be asked to vote for multiple elections at the same time. So some of these elections and some of these positions you might have heard of we're going to be talking about some of them in, in just a, a minute. But there are others that you may not have heard of. These you can see on the right hand side of the screen here. And this is just a, a, an example of some of the many positions uh, that are elected in the United States. There might also be local votes on um, local initiatives, for example. Um, or even on state constitutional amendments. So, for example, this year, 2024, there are 10 states that have um, potential constitutional amendments that uh, their state um, populations can vote on that address the issue of abortion access and reproductive rights in the aftermath of the 2022 overturning of Roe versus Wade. So this is another um, example of, of the variety of elections um, that people might be asked to, to vote in. A lot of Americans now use electronic voting machines, but to give you an idea of, of just how many elections uh, Americans might be asked to, to vote in at the same time when they turn up at the, the polling booth, this is an old sort of paper version um, election ballot. And you can see the range of um, elections that people might be asked to, to vote for. So you can see there are quite a lot of them. It's not simply turning up and voting for president, member of the House and, and Senate. There are a lot of what come to be called down ticket elections as well. So it's worth bearing that in mind. But looking at the main elections, the ones you've probably heard of and you've heard of in the, the news, there are two elected branches of the US federal government and uh, the legislature is broken into to two branches as well. And all of them operate on different um, electoral cycles. So as you can see here, uh, the president has a four year term. Members of the House of Representatives, sometimes called Congress people, um, they operate on two year terms and um, the um, senators operate on uh, six year terms with one third of the Senate elected every two years. So it's on a rotating basis. What this means is that on every even numbered year, so 2024, 2022, 2020, for example, there will be a vote for the entire House of Representatives and a third of the Senate. And then every four years, like this year, you also have an election for the president. Why the differences in terms? Why not just have everybody elected on the, the same cycle? This really doubts, dates back to the founders and their beliefs in checks and balances in government um, at all levels. 
they really thought that different election cycles meant that the different branches would have different constituencies. And that would mean that only the really important issues, the ones that ran over several different election cycles, would be then the ones that resulted in legislation being passed or the, the president pushing for, for action on something. And they also thought that the different election cycles would keep elected officials responsible to the electorate and make sure that um, they would sort of follow up in, in different ways, that an issue that was perhaps something that was important for the House of Representatives may not be so by the time the next Senate election rolled around. So all of these work as checks and balances on each other, uh, both in terms of the, um, the branches of government, but also in terms of um, keeping a check on unfettered democracy, which the, the founders were not particularly comfortable with either. They thought it could be dangerous. So why is any of this important? Why am I telling you about the, the election cycles? It's really because although we don't often talk about them, them here, we certainly don't hear about them in the, the media, the House and the Senate elections are absolutely critical to how successful a president is likely to be over their term of, of office. So for all the things that they say on the campaign trail and all the things that they, they promise if they're, they're elected, presidents cannot make or pass rules. That has to be done by Congress. If the House or Senate is then controlled by a party different from that of the, the president, then um, this is a process called divided control. Then a president may not be able to get their legislative program enacted despite what they promised. And as you can see from the slide here, you'll see that although divided control um, was rare earlier on in the, the period, it has become much more common. And there have been relatively few years in the last 50 years or so where all three elected branches of, of government have been controlled by the, the same party. And that's really significant for thinking about uh, a president's promises and the kinds of campaigns that they are, are going to run. So it's worth bearing that in mind if you're thinking about American elections. Turning to look at the structure of um, the presidential election particularly, I think it's also worth remembering that it takes place in two sections. So the first section is primary season. It starts in January, very shortly after New Year, and runs roughly through to July or August, to um, the period where the party holds their convention. So late summer, effectively, varies a little year on year. Now, primaries are about candidates looking to win the right to run for president to represent their particular party. Some years, there's only one candidate uh, for the party. Other years, there, uh, there are many. Um, so the primary season can be more or less um, of a, a campaign process than, than others. It really depends on the, the year. It's time consuming and it's expensive because it is done state by state. So candidates have to win um, support from each state. So it takes a long process, which is why it runs over several months. Um, and it reflects the historical uh, importance of the states in the system of American government. The second section of the election is sort of the general election period. So that starts with the party nomination conferences and runs through to the, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Now, this is where the two candidates who have been chosen by their parties effectively run head to head uh, for the right to become president of the, the United States. Now, this year, was particularly unusual because Joe Biden ran in the primary season and had enough support from them, from all of the state democratic parties to run for president. 
As we know, of course, he stepped down and um, withdrew from the cam campaign before the election. And Kamala Harris was nominated by a process that I very much doubt we will ever see again, um, by a special online meeting of uh, delegates to the, the Democratic Convention who agreed at this special meeting to transfer their support from Joe Biden to Kamala Harris, which effectively nominated her for the um, to run for, for president and allowed her campaign to continue. Like I said, it's extraordinarily rare and I don't expect to, to ever see it again. But it does mean that the system that we're talking about can sometimes change a little bit if circumstances require them to. All right. So staying with the presidential election and thinking about elections per se, it, that sort of helps us to think about this very strange element of American elections, which is the electoral college. So you might be familiar with the map that's on the screen. This is the, um, the electoral college vote from the, the last presidential election in 2020. The presidential election is not one national vote. It is, in effect, 50 state level votes, which is why you see maps like this, with it broken down by states and numbers in each of the, the states. Um, those numbers represent the number of seats in the Electoral College that each candidate won. Now, a candidate has to win a majority of the Electoral College votes to, or a candidate has to win a majority of the votes in a state to win all of the Electoral College votes. So it's a first past the post winner takes all system. With the exception of uh, Maine and Nebraska, those where you can see little circles within the state who split their vote. But it's only those two states out of the, the 50. So if you're a candidate and you're looking to, to win the, the election um, to, to be president, you're not thinking about how popular I am I nationally. You're thinking about how many of these states can I win because I need to win a majority of the electoral college votes? So they're thinking about their chances in each state rather than overall nationally. Now, this is partly because the US is a federal system where states retain a significant amount of power and authority over the things that happen within their, their borders. So Article 1, Section 4, which um, is the part of the US Constitution that deals with Congress, explicitly gives control over running elections to the states. So you can see the wording of it here on the screen. And over time, this has been interpreted to mean that, uh, that states have the right to control how the presidential election runs as well as state level elections. Under Article 2, Section 1, that you can see here on the, the screen, um, Americans don't vote directly for the president. This is where the Electoral College comes in. When Americans vote, what they're voting for is a slate of state-level party-chosen electors who, in December of election year, meet formally to elect the president and the vice president of the United States. Now. Although the meeting of the Electoral College is a formality, the candidates do not officially become president-elect until after the Electoral College has met. So despite shortly after on election day or shortly after election day, all of the the media coverage which says so so and so candidate has, has been elected, it doesn't officially happen until the Electoral College meets in the States and they sign pieces of paper which certify that they have um, elected such and such a, a candidate. Now, each state has a number of electors which is equal to the number of senators plus the number of members of the House of Representatives. In, in addition, Washington DC, which doesn't have senators because it's not a state, has three additional electors at the Electoral College, which makes for a total of 538, which is why a candidate to win the presidency needs 270 votes in the Electoral College system. 
the electors are pledged to vote for the candidate who won the state vote. And in 32 out of the 50 states, they are required to do this by state law. So back in 2016, there was a lot of discussion about so-called faithless electors, which might be people at the Electoral College who in close states might um, might vote for the uh, for a different candidate from the one that their state uh, vote suggested. That didn't happen. And listen, in a majority of states, by law, that isn't possible. So despite claims that the Electoral College could change the outcome of the, the election, it's really almost impossible for them to do so. Thinking about this overall, I think that the easiest way to understand the Electoral College system is to think of the presidential election as a series of state level votes rather than one overall vote, where a candidate has to win a majority of states or at least a majority of state votes, rather than winning the majority of the popular vote. Throughout history, in most cases, the winner of the Electoral College also won a majority of the, the popular vote. It's only in recent years where the possibility of different results in those two elections have become slightly different. It's worth bearing in mind that state control of elections has other significant consequences too. So things like each state can control the qualifications and requirements of voting in that state. To give you examples, uh, states might differ on things like uh, postal voting or absentee ballots, what, uh, what requirements are necessary to make that valid or if they will have them at all, um, whether identification is needed to be able to vote, the location of polling stations, the opening hours of polling stations, whether early voting is permitted and a whole range of other types of, of requirements and regulations. They're important because they actually can have an impact on how easy or difficult it is for some people to be able to vote. So, for example, the American Civil Liberties Union estimates that about 21 million Americans, or roughly 11% of the population, do not have government-issued ID that is acceptable to be able to vote. So, if you remember, there's lots of discussion around the, the general election here in the UK this year, where if people didn't have the forms of ID that were necessary, they could apply to the, the government for a free sort of voter ID card that would allow them to, to go to the poll and be able to vote. In the US, that doesn't happen. Um, certainly not, um, certainly not free, at least. It's been estimated that the costs of things like document fees, travel expenses and, and waiting times to get these documents if somebody doesn't already have them is somewhere between $75 and $175 per person. Now that cost and the time involved often puts getting it outside of the reach of the, the poorest Americans um, and often very difficult for people with disabilities or the elderly or those who live in rural areas who perhaps don't have access to good public transport or a car, so can't actually get to the places that they need to to be able to get these forms of identification. So that's potentially 11% of the population that is, it may well be excluded from voting simply because they don't have an appropriate document. And as you can see here, there's a racial discrepancy with this too. So it's roughly estimated that about 8% of the white American population don't have the kind of identification that is, is possible to allow them to vote, while 25% while of the black American population often don't have these forms of identification. And so what you see is that larger numbers of minority voters are excluded from voting through laws like this. So when we say that state control over elections can have a significant impact, these are the kinds of things that we're, we're talking about. And it's worth thinking about if you're thinking about how American elections take place. Thinking more broadly, thinking about other Elements. There are, I think, a couple of 
important consequences of this state by state approach, both to the primary elections and then to the general election for the presidency that have come in for debate in recent years, um, which we might want to, to talk about a little bit when we meet on the 5th of November. The first is the question of so-called swing states. So you can see them on the, the table here. They're the, they're the ones that are in the, the grayed out colors. There are expected to be roughly seven of them in this particular election. So this isn't that different as well from here in the UK, where we have parliamentary seats that have historically been dominated by one party or another and other constituents with constituencies which have perhaps changed more regularly between the, the major parties. States in the US aren't really any different, they're just significantly larger with, with bigger populations. So what you see here is that the darker states the, are the ones that have more traditionally voted Democrat for the case of those in blue and Republican for those in the um, in, who are represented in the red here. This is, these are predictions for, um, for this year's election, but to emphasize only, uh, only predictions. Um, so you can see how, um, it actually looks like it's, it's quite dominated by, by Republican votes, but actually the, the blue states are often more heavily, de uh, heavily populated. And so they carry more, um, electoral college votes. Now, because these swing states, these seven grey states, are so important for victory, mean the difference between winning and losing the, the election, candidates and their teams to s tend to spend a lot of time focused on these states. And not just time, but a lot of the money that they raise in these states too. Um, now, just to give you an example, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, which is, is based in Wisconsin, estimates that um, between the middle of July and the middle of September, one or other of the candidates or the vice presidential candidates visited the state more than 16 times, which averages out about once a week. Which doesn't sound too bad until you consider that there are 50 states in this election and they're visiting Wisconsin once a week. So you get a sense of the fact that these swing states get more of the focus um, of the, the, the attention of the, the candidates. And it can lead voters in other states to feel disenfranchised, um, that their votes aren't considered as important as those in, in swing states, that the candidates aren't really interested in them um, because they're not getting visits and they're not getting advertising and, and everything else that, that comes with the election. So it can lead to a sort of disillusionment with politics, which then maybe leads to, to low turnout and other factors which are often seen as, as negative in a democratic system. The second issue is actually the cost of the elections, uh, which is made significantly higher by the fact that presidential candidates have to run state by state by state. So these costs include things like travel and staff and running events. Um, they also quite critically involve things like um, campaign ads, whether that's print or radio, social media or, or television. Um, I'm a real fan of campaign ads. I think they're, they're absolutely fascinating as a way of, of thinking about the, the issues of the, the time. So I always, I'm always looking for, for those, but they are expensive and especially if you're having to run them in different state markets. Now, what you're seeing on screen here are the, the costs of previous elections. And what you can see is that the combined cost of pres the presidential election and the congressional elections in 2020 came to roughly $14.4 billion, significantly more, as you can see, than the previous three elections and actually more than, than the elections before those as well. Uh, in the other graph, you can see that actually Democrats historically have spent slightly more than, than Republicans, although that varies election on election. Now, these, these figures, this massive increase in, in numbers um, applies whether you consider uh, taking inflation into account or you look at just the, the absolute numbers. So thinking about this, the cost of the election, the money that has to be, uh, to, has to be spent has to come from 
from somewhere, right? So one of the issues that often comes up around um, elections is the question of fundraising. So you might perhaps remember after Joe Biden dropped out of the election and Kamala Harris um, came in, that there were headlines like these pointing out that in the first week that she was running, she raised almost $200 million. That's a huge amount of, of money. Um, and on one hand, you could say that um, individuals and, and groups donating money to, to candidates to run for election is actually a, a civic exercise. It's a way of participating in the election, of showing who you support that goes beyond just turning up to the, the ballot box and, and voting. Now, that is certainly true. But there are big concerns around the amount of money in American politics that is probably worth also looking at or considering when we're thinking about this, this topic. So one concern is that raising money from big donors leads to questions of that those donors then have undue influence over the, the candidates. Um, and this applies at congressional level as well as um, at the presidential level. But the idea of, of why are they giving so much money and what are they going to expect in return if their preferred candidate wins the election? The question of, you know, things being in, in grey areas and, and whether things are above board or not. A second question that we see often, particularly in relation to the two year cycle of the congressional elections, is the, this idea that maybe the need to fundraise distracts a candidate from actually doing the job. If they're already in office and they're running for re-election, it takes up so much of their time that it's actually stopping them doing the job that they were elected to do. Um, others would uh, others would deny that, but um, I think it's definitely something that's worth worth considering and, and thinking about. Um, members of Congress, for example, will tell you that they never stop fundraising, not in the the whole two years that they're in office. That keeps going on. So, is that something that we think is is healthy in a democracy? And the third thing comes as a result of a 2010 Supreme Court ruling in a case called Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. Now, this held that companies and businesses could use funds to support election campaigns so long as they weren't naming candidates. So they might run a campaign issue on uh, a campaign advert, sorry, on a particular issue that has become part of the campaign, either at a national level or at a state level. And the amount of this money since um, since 2010, and th this decision um, allowed for that spending to go on so long as, as um, they didn't mention candidates. And this was protected, the, the justices said, under uh, the First Amendment freedom of speech, that commenting on the election was the equivalent of freedom of, of speech. Since that decision in 2010, the, no, the amount of money spent in elections on this kind of sort of soft advertising, issue based advertising by interest groups has massively expanded. And there has been concern among many critics of the, the decision and, and of elections generally that what this does is it gives those who have more money a bigger voice in elections that it drowns out ordinary Americans and puts power with those who have money and who can use their money to shout the loudest. So again, if you're looking at campaign ads, particularly those who are being, that are being run not by the candidates, but by um, special interest organisations, you might think about um, whether those views being expressed are really the, the views of the electorate or whether they're being used to, to shape the, the outcome of the election. So I hope that that gives you some things to, to think about in relation to the US election, but, and I hope it helps explain a little bit the way in which American elections take place and some of the reasons for them. Um, I look forward to meeting you on November the 5th when we will follow up on this discussion.
and no doubt talk about some of these issues as well as many others. So, thank you.